of the physical well-being of only the patient as they sit before us. It extends to all of our fellow man and any injustice inflicted upon them. We treat hunger and malnourishment because we believe in a right to food. We treat, we ease pain because we believe in the human right to be free of sub being subjected to torture. We treat injury and life-threatening conditions because we believe in a right to life. And we treat everyone without discrimination because we believe in equality. I do not believe that one can be a healthcare worker, but remain absent when these rights are threatened. When that foundation on, on which our shared humanity is built quakes, the consequences echo through all of us. I welcome you again, and I thank you for the integrity you have shown in coming today. We have gathered some of the best minds on medical ethics and human rights and trauma in the wake of their violation today to speak to you. I hope this uh, meeting and the seminar gives you much insight. Thank you very much. So uh, we welcome our first speaker, which is uh, Ms. Mika Teko Mafuyeka. She is a human rights lawyer and legal advisor based in the Witt Center for Health, Economics and Decision Science. And her subject is titled The Right to Health, a focus on Gaza. Thank you. Hey. So, we've got to start that. There we go. Share. We're already sharing screen. Here we go. PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm just quickly going to double check. Okay. Aisha, may you just please confirm that you guys can see our screen share? I can't see the screen share, although it's sharing uh, in Teams, so we cannot see the, um, the, the the presentation as such. Okay, I'm going to make one setting change, and you can confirm for us. I'm going to stop sharing. Sorry, Mika. It is a lovely view of the presenters. Good to meet you and thank you for joining <laughs> us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> That's fine, Marcilla. Perfect. And I love we can see our presenter and we can see our presentation. Thank you. Lovely. OK, let's go. Um, good afternoon or evening, everybody. As I've already been introduced, my name is Mika Dekomafiega, and I'll be talking about the right to health with a focus on Gaza. But as a point of departure, I think it's very important for us to speak about human rights and also define um, human rights. So human rights are universal rights of all human beings, regardless of race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or status. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the security of person. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services. Right. And the South African Constitutional Bill of Rights echoes these human rights in that everyone has the right to human dignity, equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedom. Our Bill of Rights affirms our country's democratic values of human dignity, equality, and freedom. The provisions of the Bill of Rights are binding to natural and juristic persons. The recognition of, in, of inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all human beings is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. 
member states to multiple treaties and international organizations in co uh, cooperation with the UN have pledged themselves to achieve the promotion of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms. So that backdrop of what human rights are, what is the right to health? So health, for starters, is defined in the World Health Organization's 1946 um, Constitution Preamble as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The preamble goes on to state that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. The right to health was further reiterated in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights as part of the right to an adequate standard of living. And again, as a human right in the 1966 International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Right. So what does the right to health entail? As shown, the right to health and other health-related human rights are legally binding commitments enshrined in international human rights instruments. These include freedoms and entitlements. Entitlements include the right to access quality health services without any discrimination. Every human has the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. The right to health also includes four essential interrelated elements. Availability refers to the need for a sufficient quantity of functioning health facilities, goods, and services for all. Accessibility requires that health facilities, goods, and services must be accessible to everybody. Acceptability relates to respect for medical ethics, culturally appropriate and sensitivity to gender. Quality extends to the underlying determinant of health. For example, safe and portable water and sanitation, as well as requiring that health facilities, goods and services are scientifically and medically approved. All these essential elements are not being met and are actively being infringed upon in Gaza by Israel right now. The right to health is an inclusive right. It extends to other factors that help us lead a healthy life, such as safe drinking water and adequate sanitation, safe food, adequate nutrition and housing, healthy working and environmental conditions, healthy related education and information, and gender equality. All these elements are being infringed upon by Israel and Gaza right now. The right to health contains entitlements. These entitlements include the right to a system of health protection, providing equality of opportunity for everyone to enjoy the highest attainable level of health. The right to prevention, treatment and control of diseases. Access to essential medicine, maternal, child and reproductive health and equal and timely access to basic health services. All of these entitlements are being infringed upon by Israel and Gaza right now. So how has Israel infringed the right to health amongst other rights in Gaza? The dehumanization of Palestinians. On October 9th, Israeli Defense Minister Yuav Galet labeled Palestinians in Gaza human animals and declared a complete siege of the enclave. Over 35,000 Palestinians have been killed by Israel since October 7th. However, the violence against Palestinians at the hands of Israel didn't only start on the 7th of October. Aid in Gaza, an area reliant upon external relief, dropped from 500 to 600 trucks a day to just 98 daily in February 2024. Hunger, malnutrition, and starvation. Starvation of civilians as a method of warfare constitute a crime in any armed conflict. The besieging party must allow the free passage of foodstuffs and other essential supplies. 
Israel hasn't been allowing free passage of food in Gaza. Article 55 of the Geneva Convention stipulates or something we're having technical issues there we go we're back article 55 of the geneva convention stipulates that the occupying power has the duty of ensuring the food and medical supply or supplies of the population and may not requisition foodstuff articles or medical supplies available um, in the occupied territory article 47 also stipulates Protected persons who are in occupied territory shall not be deprived of the benefits of the present convention. Failure to ensure food in the occupied territory may amount to the violation of Rule 53 of the customary international humanitarian law, which explicitly forbids the starvation of civilian populations as a method of warfare. Cutting of food supply and aid to Gaza by Israel. This has led to malnutrition, particularly amongst children, pregnant women, and the elderly. Malnutrition in children leads to stunting and wasting. What is stunting? Child stunting refers to a child who is too short for his or her age and is a result of chronic or recurring malnutrition. Wasting is defined, defined as low weight for height. It often indicates recent and severe weight loss. It usually occurs when a person has not had food or adequate um, quality or quantity, or they have had frequent or prolonged illness. We have all seen the picture of young children in Gaza who are now skin and bones. If they're not killed by the bombs or trapped under rubble, they are being starved to death. These actions by Israel violate the rights of Palestinians in Gaza the right to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation, safe food, adequate nutrition and housing. Prior to the ongoing Israeli war on Gaza, 70% of, of the Gaza Strip's children suffered from varying health issues, including malnutrition, anemia and weakened immunity. However, this number has now increased to over 90% as a result of these unprecedented attacks um, on Gaza. Infants in Gaza are at continuous risk of starvation, death, dehydration, and other health hazards due to overcrowding. Pregnant women, mothers, newborns are seriously threatened by Israeli attacks and disruptions and damage of health facilities. They are also impacted by the non-operation of health facilities, the large-scale displacement, and the collapse of food water and electricity supplies. The killing by Israeli forces of hungry Palestinians waiting for aid in Gaza on the 29th of February. Now it's been termed the flower massacre. More than 100 Palestinians were killed. More than 700 were wounded. Bodies of Palestinians were flattened by Israeli armored vehicles. No regard for their life, for their right to life, right to food, freedom, or their dignity. The targeting of sites that produce and distribute food and using starvation as a, war, as a weapon of war is not allowed. Attacks on hospitals and deliberately targeting hospitals and medical infrastructure. Israel has attacked the Indonesian hospital, Al Quds Hospital, Al Shifa Hospital, the Turkish Palestinian Friendship Hospital, and the International Eye Hospital. These actions have led to a lack of medicine, vaccinations, safe water and sanitation services, leading to a surge in infectious diseases and a public health crisis. These actions are a violation of all the human rights and entitlements stated at the beginning of this presentation, a violation of the right to a system of health protection, <clears throat> providing equality of opportunity for everyone to enjoy the highest attainment level of health, the right to prevention, treatment, and control of diseases, access to essential medicine, maternal, child, and reproductive health, equal and timely access to basic health care. These actions and these attacks are an infringement of all of those rights and entitlements. These actions and others not mentioned 
and continue uh, and could continue to infringe on Palestinians' basic human rights, and more specifically, their right to health. So why is it important to protect human rights and the right to health? It is an obligation placed on states to protect and uphold human rights and the right to health. Our Bill of Rights dictates that we do so. The fabric of society and humanity dictates so. It is a moral obligation on all human beings. It is for humanity, for Ubuntu. We know, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of Palestinians. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to bring on our next speaker, Dr. Sheetal Soni um, from the University of KZN. She's joining us via Zoom. Um, and so for that reason, there will be a short break of technical setup, but I hope you will bear with me. Okay. Dr. Sony, could I ask you to please activate your uh, screen share and microphone? It seems that Dr. Sony is a touch delayed. All right, so given that we have a moment of free time, are there any questions? for our first speaker. I'm going to bring the microphone to you. Or oh, actually, would you mind coming upstage so that those on Zoom can see you? Yes. You can just Thank you, Paul. An excellent overview. Okay, World Health Assembly. There's SAMA, there's the American Medical Association, the BMJ. Nobody's saying doing anything. No one's enforcing anything. These guys are doing whatever they want with sheer impunity. So we have the list of all the human rights enshrined in the formation of the World Health Organization and the United Nations, but it means nothing. These institutions mean nothing. The ICJ is now silent. I mean, I Google every morning, ICJ go to the news. Nothing is being enforced. There was a call for a ceasefire by the Security Council. Toothless. Israel is continuing to deny. I mean, as a human rights specialist, I mean, what mechanisms are in place to stop? what Israel is doing, because it seems as if they can do whatever they want to, and it's just pointless doing anything or saying anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you very much for that point. I think it speaks to a shared frustration amongst all of us. I think in the later Q&A session, I think we must perhaps consider delving a bit deeper into that, because it is definitely something that is in the back of all of our minds. Um, I'm going to try again, Dr. Sony, whether you are ready for your presentation. Seem perhaps not just yet. Dr. Sony, I can't hear you. I'm not sure whether the teams can hear you at the moment. No, Marcelia, we can't hear Dr. Sony. Can't hear Dr. Sony. I can see it looks that she is sharing her screen. Can everyone see her screen being shared? Yes. Okay, yes. Great. All right. Okay, let me see quickly if I'm able to unmute Dr. Sony if she is muted.
Dr. Sony. All right, Dr. Sony, I'm going to try again. Um, would you mind trying to speak and we'll see if we are able to hear you properly? Okay, unfortunately, your sound is not coming through for us at the moment. But I think that that may be on your side with the microphone. Okay, I do apologize for the slight delay, everyone. Um, we are going to get back on track in just a moment. Dr. Sony, would you mind trying to log out quickly and then log back in again, please? And then we will see if that brings you back on board. Hmm. OK, we're just going to give that a moment. Is there anyone in the chat who would like to add any questions? Or perhaps if our first speaker, Ms. Mikateko Mafuyeka, would like to address the gentleman who just came on's frustrations around feeling that nothing is being done. Okay. Ms. Mikateko Mafuyeka is going to speak to that point in the meanwhile. Uh, I just want to say that I share the same frustrations and sentiments because it feels like, for example, now, with um, the resolution for a ceasefire for the remainder of like Ramadan. That's not sufficient, that is not enough. And then even when that was taken, the bombardments did not stop. So I think from our side, even with the frustrations, it's just to continue and to be relentless in terms of having these type of conversations and dialogues, you know, and being visible, being vocal, and putting pressure and threatening the legitimacy of these international bodies and organizations to say, we are watching. If you continue to do nothing, you are putting you know, humanitarian law and international law at risk. It is on you to actually act. And I also think we need to arrive at the point of sanctions. You know, because even with apartheid in South Africa, the apartheid government didn't wake up and decide it's morally bankrupt or incorrect what they were doing. It's because it started stopped being profitable. There were sanctions, economic sanctions, in terms of culture, sports, and everything. So I think those also need to be imposed on Israel to force their hand and those that back them, you know, to stop what is currently happening. So I think what we're doing in terms of continuing being vocal and calling it out and venting out our frustrations and just not relenting, long term, we will hopefully start to see a shift and something happening. So yeah, I want to say that. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Mafieka. Um, and to your point, I absolutely agree. It's a matter of persistence, because as we know, if if it, uh, many corporations and governments had their way, there would be no say at all. Um, so we do the best we can and attendance, I think, is paramount. So thank you all again. Um, I'm going to see whether Dr. Sony has managed to rejoin us. Um, and if there is still difficulty, then we will jump to our third speaker, which is Dr. Sandra Fernandez. Let me just check on technical matters quickly. Okay. It does not seem, Dr. Sony, can you try to speak for us? Can you hear me, Dr. Theron? Aha, uh -huh. yes, progress. Yes, I can hear you. It's a little bit faint. Um, are you able to perhaps adjust your microphone so that we can hear you a bit better? Is this any better? It's slightly better. My microphone is at maximum. Maybe if I try and speak a bit louder. There we go. Much better. We can hear you perfectly now. 
All right. Now you can perhaps just see if you are able to screen share for us. Good. We're able to see your PowerPoint. You can just adjust whichever setting you'd like to go through it. Wonderful. Okay. Just let me know when it does fill the screen. When it does, it's, I think, filled the screen very well. Yes, that's perfectly okay. fine. Okay, great. Right, so, right. Um, may I introduce you quickly? Of course. Lovely. So everyone, this is Dr. Sheetal Soni. She is a academic leader for research and higher degrees at the University of Witwatersrand. Um, and she is also a senior lecturer on the matters of bioethics and international human uh, rights. Is that correct, Dr. Soni? I stand under correction. Please tell me if I have left anything out. Um. So I am at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and I'm a senior lecturer in international law, bioethics, and intellectual property law, but mostly correct. Lovely. Over to you. Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. I apologize for not being able to be there in person. It would have been wonderful to meet healthcare workers that are passionate about what is going on in the Middle East right now. Um, it would have been wonderful to meet my fellow speakers as well. Um, unfortunately, due to teaching commitments, I had to stay in KwaZulu-Natal this evening. So I am a senior lecturer at the School of Law here, and I've been teaching international law for about 10 years or more than 10 years here. So international law is very close to my heart, and it also permeates my other research areas like medical law, like bioethics. So um, this evening, there's a couple of things that I would like to talk about. I hope that I can be as quick as I can and not um, not sort of go on as if I'm in a lecture, um, but largely just to talk to you about the international law, I think. I hear from the questions from the audience that the enforceability and what these protections mean practically on the ground, that's causing the most frustration. So maybe I can focus on that aspect. What is genocide and these crimes against humanity? And how is the right to health um, undergoing this systematic assault in the occupied Palestinian territories. So just to sort of go to that question on international law, I think a lot of our frustration comes through from the fact that our understanding of law and our understanding of how law can be applied and how it protects people, it's limited to national law. And national law, you'll understand, it applies in quite a rigid fashion. If we know what the law is, we understand what the consequences for breaching the law would be. We understand the consequences, fines, imprisonment, judicial proceedings, but international law works differently. International law comes, I've heard the word toothless come from the audience, and one of the things I tell my students is that international law as a system, it's criticized as being this toothless tiger, this body of rules that you can't really enforce without states being prepared to do so, without them having that will. And the willpower, it's, it's not something we find in national law. We don't have a choice as to whether the criminal law applies to us. It just does. But in international law, we need that political will for states to stand together and behave in a uniform way and respect bare minimum standards at the very least. So that just that is one issue that we that we find in these in these in these matters. Um, I also want to talk about genocide. You would have heard the word if you've been following the South Africa versus Israel case in the International Court of Justice, you would have heard that term genocide. So I just want to talk about what that is and how we identify it and also crimes against humanity. But more particularly, what makes what is happening in Gaza a little bit different to the other situations where we see 
crimes against humanity and genocide is that these international crimes are taking place in the context of a territory that is occupied. Israel is an occupying power. And even if the world courts had to say there's no genocide, even if states did not want to stand behind the fact that there are crimes against humanity, as an occupying power, Israel already has international law obligations in respect of the Palestinian people. So there's already a bare minimum that Israel needs to be doing in terms of these, this population <coughs> before we even look at these crimes. And then we can look at humanitarian law and that right to health. And here specifically, what I'd like to just point out is um, things like the, the assault on healthcare facilities, humanitarian aid workers, um, healthcare workers, the violation of corpses and protection of the dead under international law, um, the allegations of organ harvesting and organ trafficking, um, as well as the unethical administration and withholding of access to medication to Palestinians in the occupied territory. So like I was saying, we start off with this mass frustration with the international legal system. And what I hope you understand from observing the international system as it's been demonstrated through the state players, the world court, Israel and Palestine, is that you'll understand that the international system, um, it operates largely on the basis of state compliance, states complying with the legal provisions. And I always say states um, they make international law primarily, but they also enforce it. It's up to them to respect it and enforce it and to call other states out and hold states responsible when they don't do this. So I was saying earlier that international law doesn't bind the way our national law does. It can only bind a state that consents to the application. So you may have heard about the International Criminal Court and Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, saying that he actually doesn't care about the International Criminal Court. And the reason that he said that is because Israel is not a state party to the International Criminal Court and they can behave on the basis that the court does not even exist. With that being said, South Africa and other states have lodged um, complaints to the prosecutor of the international court um, in respect of Israel's conduct in Gaza. Um, and the law that creates that international criminal court, it doesn't bind Israel, but we can hold Israel accountable because Palestine is a state party to the International Criminal Court. And because Palestinians are victims, this can be used as a basis to bring complaints to the International Criminal Court. You may remember a similar thing happened last year when an arrest warrant was issued for Vladimir Putin. And Putin said he didn't care the warrant meant nothing, and that is because Russia is not party to the court. But we'll talk about that court a bit later. Um, so you're aware of the South Africa versus Israel case in the International Court of Justice. And you know what I want to mention about that case, you'll understand our legal team started their argument by condemning the October 7th attacks where the militants, the Hamas militants, committed atrocities against Israeli civilians. Um, however, South Africa, the legal team, very strongly tried to put into perspective the historical context of that attack, the October 7th attack. The fact that even though these atrocities took place, they took place in the context of an occupied population that has been at the mercy of the occupying power, dehumanized by the occupying power, and suffered human rights violations for more than 75 years prior to October 7th. And that historical context is incredibly important. So it's interesting going forward 
what the court will permit in respect of that argument when it does discuss or when it does hear the full genocide case. You'll also know that Israel argues that what it's doing in Gaza, in Gaza is defending itself. It's just exercising its right to self-defense in, in Gaza. But again, we've got this problem that even though self-defense is a right under international law, it's self-defense in an occupied territory. And think about that for a minute, that Israel is arguing that it's defending itself against the population that it's been occupying for decades, that it's been oppressing for decades. And that is why that historical context is so incredibly important. South Africa has also argued that this isn't self-defense at all. It's collective punishment of the population of Gaza, the civilian population. Israel's argued that Hamas has infiltrated the population. They're using civilians as human shields. But really, if we look at the decimation of Gaza and what Israel has to show for that decimation, there's really there's no discrimination. They are literally attacking what they understand are very densely populated civilian areas. So, um, you know, apart from the fact that after the October 7th attack and after the buzz in the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice, there's also been a rise in anti-Semitism <laughs> and Islamophobia related crimes. Um, there's also been a leverage of uh, criticism that even disagreeing with um, Israel's argument or trying to, for instance, pass a ceasefire resolution, which you, you may understand has now passed on Monday, um, that those acts are anti-Semitic. Um, ben Gavir, the minister in, um, in, in Israel has now concluded that the entire United Nations system is anti-Semitic because the Security Council has passed a resolution that wants to work towards a ceasefire in, in Gaza. Um, so you you hear these words being, being thrown around. And what I think we must strongly understand is that the enforcement of international law and the protection of human rights is not anti-Semitic. We're not leveraging a statement against the Jewish population. We want the law to be respected. We want rights protected. So we'll start with the main allegation, the main charge that South Africa has against Israel, and that's genocide. And the definition of genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin, who, when he was younger, asked his teacher why there was no word or no offense or crime uh, to describe the destruction of a people. We knew what destroying one person was or attacking one person is, but what if you do this to a whole population, a people? And that's where that word genocide came from. Um, genos and Cide, the killing of people based on some feature or characteristic like ethnicity, religion, race. And um, look, the important point that I want to raise here from this, this understanding of what genocide is, is that genocide can take place in relation to an event where there's a mass killing of a population. But we tend to see it as a coordinated plan of different actions that have a common purpose, and that is destroying the foundations of life of a national group with the aim of annihilating that group. And if you look at what's happened in Gaza, Gaza is uninhabitable. The UN postulates that it's going to take at least 70 years to render Gaza to what it was prior to, you know, the October, well, October 6th, really, you know, Israel's response. So, um, and it's really, it's really indiscriminate in terms of 
people themselves, people are targeted because of the group that they belong to, um, that feature that identifies them as a target for extermination, really. So we associate that word with, you know, the Holocaust and, and the Namibian genocide of the Herero people, the Armenian genocide, several genocides of past. We're seeing it again, but what we're seeing now is being live streamed to us in our homes, at our workplace, the victims themselves are showing us what is happening. And we've never had this bird's eye view uh, to a genocide in this way. Um, we've also seen a scale of destruction and death that is unprecedented. Um, in the last few months, more children have died in Gaza than the number of children that have died over the last five years of world conflict, conflicts all over the world. It's an unreal number that we're actually looking at in Gaza. So genocide, we understand it as killing members of a group, but it's actually other things as well. Um, it could be the, the attack on bodily integrity or mental health, um, deliberately inflicting conditions of life that are intended to bring about destruction of the group, imposing measures intended to prevent births in the group, or forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, moving children. And if you think back to last year, when that warrant of arrest was issued for Putin, it was exactly for that, the fact that he had transferred, he moved Ukrainian children out of Ukraine. And he said it's to protect them. Um, but um, in terms of international law, that's actually a war crime as well as a potential act of genocide. And we see, we see the evidence of this happening in Gaza. Um, just recently, the IDF relocated Gazan orphans to the West Bank. They move them without government position, again, arguing that it's for their safety. Children in Gaza, you'll understand, they are especially vulnerable. Um, you also know perhaps that one of the objects that is uh, prohibited from entering Gaza is birthing kits, anesthesia, um, oxygen cylinders, incubators. So we also see that this is going to affect births in the group. What is it exactly? What is the purpose for, for removing these items and not permitting them into Gaza? Why not permit infant formula into Gaza? And what I'd like you to understand is look at the target. Look at the target of the killing. It's, the, it's most women and children most women and children, if you want to attack a population and destroy a population, you also need to destroy the very basic way, the most vulnerable way that that population can reconstruct itself. You kill children so they cannot grow up. You kill women so they cannot have more children. You ensure that babies will probably die very soon after birth or they'll starve. There's no formula. Um, so it's a level of atrocities combined that is just unprecedented. One point I want to raise from here is in relation to other states, and it goes back to that point of what can we do? What, what is the purpose of the ICJ order? What is the purpose of the resolution? Collectively, these things can help us because look at what the Genocide Convention says. It says that apart from committing genocide, there's other offenses, there's other crimes in international law. Look at paragraph E, complicity in genocide. It means that from the moment that the ICJ said it's plausible that Israel's committing genocide, it means that any state providing support to Israel, political, giving them weapons, sending them soldiers, they are complicit in a plausible genocide. And as this case proceeds in the International Court of Justice, this, this will only become more damning for states. And I understand the frustration and I understand how helpless we feel. But what I also want you to observe now, especially in the context of the ceasefire resolution, um, it is for the month of Ramadan, which we understand um, is halfway past already. 
but it wants a, a sustainable ceasefire. When we have when we have documents like this come out of the structures, it only provides a more damning case against the states that are still supporting the aggressor. It's now going to be very difficult to send weapons to a state that the ICJ has said is plausibly committing genocide, that the Security Council has said needs to cease fire. Just yesterday, Francesca Albanese, who is a special rapporteur for the occupied territories, issued her report to the Human Rights Council, her fourth report that she called Anatomy of a Genocide. And she's confirmed, all of the human rights um, um, experts have confirmed there's reasonable grounds that this is a genocide. And she goes on to say that specifically, there's three things that we can see the intent of Israel to commit genocide, the bodily and mental harm to the group, um, the inflicting of group conditions of life that are designed to bring about physical destruction and imposing measures to prevent births. We see that the doctors have told us, the humanitarian workers have told us, the UN uh, personnel in Gaza have told us that this is what is happening. And she's also concluded that what's happening in Gaza is the most extreme stage of a long-standing settler colonial process of erasure of the native population, the Palestinians. So that's the charge, genocide. Israel says it's um, defending itself. And in terms of international law, one of the fundamental principles is that states mustn't use force against each other. We should not enter into conflict. We should strive for peace and to resolve disputes by peace. But with that being said, the charter does envisage that there may be reasons for force to be necessary, like self-defense. But again, um, it's a lot of detail to go in, but just to sort of let you know how this will work and how the court will have to look at it. Self-defense in the charter in Article 51, um, the charter says that nothing in the charter will impair the right of self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations. Israel is a member of the United Nations. Palestine, you may be aware, they're in the United Nations, but they have the special status of an observer state. The only reason for that is because um, Israel's allies that sit on the Security Council refuse to recognize Palestine, even though more than 140 states, including ourselves, recognize that Palestine is a state. The problem that Israel will have in proving self-defense is this. Um, the charter says that you can defend yourself if an armed attack occurs. And the way that the court historically interprets this is state to state violence, a state attacking another state. Israel was attacked, but it wasn't attacked by Palestine. It was attacked by a militant group. And this was the same problem that the United States had when it was attacked by what it concluded could be the Taliban um, in the September 11th attacks. Um, and the difficulty is that a militant group doesn't represent a state. Hamas is not Palestine. So um, again, it only points to that conclusion that Israel wants to defend itself against Hamas and rid, eradicate Gaza of Hamas, but it's doing so by attacking the population, the innocent state population. Proportionality, self-defense must be proportional and nothing can justify the October 7th attack. Even if we say it took place in the context of Palestinians suffering for decades and decades, but when we look at the way that Israel has responded, it's not proportional and proportionality is a legal threshold in international law. It's going to be very difficult for Israel to show the International Court of Justice that what it's done to Gaza was a proportional response to what happened on October 7th. It's rendered Gaza uninhabitable. It looks less like self-defense. It looks more like it's making Gaza um, it's, it's removing those conditions of life. So Israel as an occupying power 
look at its obligations under international law, even if we, you know, don't consider genocide for now. Um, the occupying power cannot acquire sovereignty over the territory. But we've seen just the other day, Israel declare that it is taking control of 800 hectares of Palestinian territory, that this is now part of the state of Israel. That's a clear violation of international law. You are stealing land, you are taking land by force. Um, occupation can only be temporary. And just in February, more than, um, you know, um, a record number of states appeared at the ICJ to argue that the occupation in Palestine, it's now become permanent. Israel has occupied Palestine for decades. Um, the occupying power must respect the laws that are enforcing the occupied territory. That's not been done because Israel controls um, the occupied territories and enforces its own law there. The occupying power must ensure sufficient hygiene and public health standards, provide food and medical care. And this is exactly what a lot of international law scholars feel will be the downfall of Israel. It's not going to be able to establish that as an occupying power, it's done this. This is a fundamental requirement for occupation that you have to take care of the the population that you're occupying, you can't oppress them, suppress them. Um, and what Israel's done, um, you know, is it's ensured, it controls the influx of goods, including food in occupied territories. And it's ensured that Palestinians have just enough um, to sustain them that ensures that they are just above the UN threshold for starvation it makes sure that it keeps them just above that. They have little, but just as little as is necessary to keep them above that threshold. The occupying power also can't transfer people. It can't take Palestinians out, and we see this. It's trying to push Palestinians into Egypt. Um, it also can't transfer its own population into the territory. And we see Israeli settlers um, trying to trying to take control of Palestinian homes that have been abandoned. We see videos of them saying that they want to clear the beachfront and they want to build their homes in Gaza. Um, so it's a flagrant disregard and violation of international law. And the list goes on. They cannot confiscate property. We've seen the videos of IDF soldiers where they're taking clothing and personal items, toys. Um, you cannot collectively punish the population. You, you must respect cultural property. Israel has destroyed almost every mosque in Gaza. Um, people who are arrested, they must be subject to internationally recognized judicial guarantees. And we know what the Palestinians have been saying for decades is that they, they don't get a fair trial. The detentions are arbitrary. They don't understand most of the time why they've been taken by the soldiers. Israel, incidentally, is the only state on the planet that arrests, detains, and prosecutes children in military court. It seizes and detains children without their parents. And we do not know how these children are kept apart from what the children tell us when they are released and they suffer in that detention. Various rights exploitations that are incredibly heartbreaking. Um, and also um, humanitarian workers, the Red Cross, they must be given access um, to the population. They must be able to work. And we see the ambulances get targeted. We see the officers get targeted. Um, protected persons in international law is so important. Pregnant women, children, they are vulnerable people. They are protected, especially in international law. And we've seen them become primary targets here. And this is what's led the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, to say that um, this is a war on children and Gaza has become a graveyard for children. We've seen journalists here, um, Motaz um, Azaza, who 
You know, he's been flagged as the most important journalist on the planet because he showed us firsthand prior to his own evacuation for safety, what was happening in Gaza. And we've seen the footage of journalists in Gaza trying to help civilians because the medical personnel just couldn't cope with the depth and degree of devastation. We know that the famine is setting in and we know it's the most vulnerable that are suffering. Record low birth weights, stunted growths, vulnerable persons that need special medication, special nutrition, they don't have access and they are suffering first. We see the children starting to die, the newborn starting to die, and children and persons with special needs um, also suffering um, ahead. The flower massacre, our previous speaker, um, she spoke to it, um, incredibly devastating. We've seen atrocities in the past, but what I can tell you as an international law scholar, we've never seen, we've never seen a civilian population be baited, be baited with food and then targeted for extermination. And here is the satellite image of the flower massacre, where you've got a dense group of civilians desperate to access food, and the IDF says they felt threatened by how many people there were, and they opened fire on the population, killing um, more than 100 civilians. And there's been several flower massacres now. Newborns are perishing because there's no incubators coming in. They're running out of oxygen. And here you see newborns who are fit to travel being evacuated to Egypt. And we all know when Al Shifa Hospital ran out of fuel, um, these newborn babies were taken out of their incubators and placed in the foil blankets. The world saw this, but weapons were still being sent to Israel. Weapons were being sent to Israel to commit these atrocities, knowing that you cannot, you cannot destroy hospitals and create a situation where there's no infant care, neonatal ICU units, no anesthesia for C-sections, no anesthesia for amputations. Um, crimes against humanities is a broader crime and it describes a number of atrocities that take place in respect of people. So destroying homes and infrastructure, indiscriminate bombings, oppression. We know this is happening because we know about the system of apartheid, sexual assault and the rape of women and children. There were allegations of sexual assault and rape in the context of October 7th, but we now have witnesses in Al Shifa Hospital, which is currently under siege, that are telling the world, that are telling the states that women are being raped in Al Shifa Hospital right now. A pregnant woman was assaulted and raped in front of her children and family who were told to watch or they would be killed. Pregnant women, these are the atrocities. And then the states aren't even asking for investigations. Um, you know, the U.S. has created the utmost mockery of international law. We're asking them for explanations. We've asked for an investigation. How do you ask an accused to a party who is committing atrocities to investigate itself? Israel refuses to let impartial parties into Gaza. It refuses to let journalists into Gaza. We've seen more journalists die in Gaza than we've ever seen in conflict before. The last point I want to talk about is the protection of the dead in international law. I really apologize. I know I'm going over time, um, but this is quite an important one because it raises a lot of flags about things that we know have been happening in Israel um, and in Palestine and about features of the occupation that now we will, will, will suddenly be pushed to the front. So in terms of international law corpses, the deceased must be protected. You don't have rights once you've died, but your body must be treated with dignity. And we see that in international law. The dead cannot be mutilated. The bodies cannot be violated. They must be given a decent burial in marked graves. Their bodies must be returned. We know that deceased Palestinians, their bodies were taken from Al-Shifa by the IDF. 
we know this, they provided no reason why they were confiscating dead bodies, but we know that they did occasionally bring bodies back. And what the witnesses have indicated, what the healthcare workers have indicated, is that it seems that these bodies came back in a state of significant manipulation. There were organs missing. Some of them weren't identifiable anymore, and they had to be buried in mass graves. Um, international law says that the dead must be searched for, collected, and evacuated. We know that there's thousands of Palestinians that are under rubble. The worst part is that for the more recent attacks, some of them stay alive for days before they die. And it's impossible to recover their bodies and provide this decent burial to them. The dead must be disposed of in a respectful manner. Um, we've seen Israel, um, the IDF tanks bulldoze through the the makeshift graveyards that the Palestinians have created to bury their dead according to their religious rights. We've seen them do this. Um, so the rights of the family members are very intertwined with the rights of, uh, well, international law protecting the dead. And um, the Human Rights Committee has said that disrespecting human remains it can amount to cruel inhuman treatment of the family of the deceased. And one of the things that we've been told is that when Palestinians die in custody, the IDF sometimes tells families that they will keep the body for the duration of their person's sentence, knowing full well the importance of having the body for, um, for the religious rites that must be performed. Israel's long been accused of harvesting organs. And here we see some evidence that there may be even more unlawful activity being undertaken in the context of war, um, because the, the Palestinians who died in custody, the Palestinians who died in uh, the bombardments, the bodies that were seized, it seems as if a lot of them come back uh, in, a, in a significantly altered fashion. Israel also operates the world's largest skin bank and many people before, including Israeli doctors themselves, have raised the alarm that something unlawful is happening in Israel. It has the largest skin bank on the planet, even though its population is very small compared to other states. And this skin bank was established more than 40 years after other states had started their skin banking activities. So where they are getting the tissues from um, has been under scrutiny in the past. And I imagine that this is going to come back um, as a very big question as well. So signs of theft of organs, no identification, refusal to disclose where the bodies had come from um, and the confiscation of bodies from the hospitals themselves. And this is not, this is not what international law wants. It doesn't want mass graves. When last did we see these? We saw this in the Holocaust of the past, and this is what's happening in Gaza today. Um, we know that access to medicines okay. as well is a massive problem. Um, I'm gonna finish in one minute, I'm almost done. Um, and like I mentioned before, the, the list of items that Israel is not permitting to come into Gaza is very arbitrary. And it's a lot of um, medications and material that the population needs. Water purification system, medication, infant uh, formula, oncology medication, EpiPens, ventilators, um, incubators, things that the population needs to survive. And the prime minister says, we will only give minimal aid, but they're not even doing that. So now that we, you know, we, we watch the atrocities daily, we get frustrated, our hearts are heavy, we are losing faith in the law now, but what is, where, where is the light? Where is the end? Um, there will be a shift in coming weeks. There will be a shift, a massive shift. We do have hope for the light in the darkness. And where we see this is collectively, when we collectively see what's been happening on the international front, what we see through the ICJ, through the resumption of funding to humanitarian aid um, in Palestine, UNRWA being refunded, 
through the ceasefire resolution coming from the UN on Monday, through the special rapporteur's report that came through yesterday, we see more vocal responses. We're seeing states calling Israel out on the atrocities and calling for it to stop uh, its, its um, bombardments. So collectively, we see a light in the darkness and we see Israel and the United States that is helping Israel fight this war. We see them become more isolated. So what can we do? We must continue our activism. We must continue to advocate. We must continue the BDS initiative and we must continue being voices for the voices who are being suppressed, the voices who are being quietened. And look, there will be a shift and the conflict will end, but the heaviest aspect of that is that it won't restore Gaza and it will not bring back the loss that these people have suffered. I really apologize for going over time, but that is my presentation for this evening. Thank you. Dr. Sony, thank you so very much. I think the insight we've gotten from your speech has been wonderful, really. I'm so grateful to you for the work and the thought that you have put into this presentation. Um, and you may not have been able to hear from where you are, but I can tell you that you did get a very good round of applause from where we are here at the venue. We really do appreciate you. Um, there are some questions that have been asked for you on the chat, um, but we are going to move to our we, we, we can ask one question and then our last speaker is going to start her setup. Um, is that all right with you? Yes, that's fine. OK, wonderful. Um, are you able to see the chat? Yes, I can. OK, great. So I'm going to select one of these, um, which I think is, is pertinent. Uh, let's say after declaring a genocide, what are the ramifications legally for a country? And then I'm going to combine that with a later question, which says clearly Israel is breaking multiple laws. Why can't they be stopped? All right, thank you. So let me answer the first part after declaring a genocide. So remember, genocide is the allegation. It hasn't been confirmed by the International Court. What the International Court of Justice has said now in January when South Africa applied for provisional measures, those provisional measures were to protect the Palestinians. The ICJ said that it's plausible that a genocide is taking place. And because of that plausibility, it agreed it's necessary to, to, pro, to grant those provisional measures. So we'll have to wait for the ICJ to pronounce on genocide. Um, that's not to say that we need to wait for the ICJ before we pressure and try and stop Israel, because that is, that is on states to do, states to, um, to stop the, the unlawful activity, right? Um, but just to answer that question as it's been asked, if it is, uh, a finding of the court that this is genocide, that is a violation of international law. And immediately, you know, the, 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 the most common understanding of that is that if that conduct is still being perpetrated, um, in no uncertain terms, the aggressor is told to stop. But, they, but look, again, <laughs> what, what good does that do really, right? But practically in international law, the ramifications would be the responsibility to rebuild Gaza, the, the compensation for survivors and for families um, for their loss. And that's going to be immense. Israel is being supported in this war. Israel is going to have to be supported by its allies to rebuild Gaza, to compensate the victims, um, and to try and restore palace, pal uh, to restore Gaza and to provide Palestinians with a living environment that is sustainable and humane. So that is sort of linking to that genocide um, sort of um, aspect of it finding by the court. Um, it sort of goes into that second question you selected, Dr. Theron, um, which is um, clearly Israel's breaking multiple laws. Why can't they be stopped? So the difficulty is, again, think about it in national law. When we 
violate the law, there are ways that the state can stop us, it can affect an arrest, etc. When a state violates international law, there's very little that other states can do to stop it apart from uh, tell it that it needs to stop. But practically, um, what states can do is um, they can impose trade sanctions, embargoes. We know this because think back, and this is why it's such it's a case that's so close to South Africans' hearts because we went through the apartheid regime. We know how apartheid ended and we know that it took internal pressure and external pressure to stop apartheid. It took the sanctions, it took the embargoes for the South African government um, to be pushed to that place where it would negotiate with the liberation groups and it would make that conscious decision to end apartheid. And that's why we know definitively that this will end and we know that Palestine will be free. It has to be because we found our freedom. Um, so that's what can be done. Um, you know, so we can talk about issuing warrants from the ICC, et cetera, but that's gonna, again, it's gonna need states to enforce that. You'll know that we got in trouble historically because we had, there was an arrest warrant for the arrest of Omar al-Bashir. And uh, when he was in South Africa, South Africa never arrested him, we let him go. And you'll know that we got into a lot of hot water last year when Putin wanted to come here for the BRICS meeting, but there was an arrest warrant for him as well. And what did we do then? We learned from our behavior in al-Bashir and we told him if he comes here, South Africa has to arrest him. We need states to be on board with protecting international law. Um, so how do we stop it? Um, we need to, um, states need to, number one, stop arming Israel. The United States can stop this. I'll be quite frank, we all know it. The United States can stop it by stopping the weapons um, the weapon supply. Stop sending money and uh, troops and weapons to Israel. They will not be able to, to, to do what they're doing in Gaza. Sanctions. Um, you know, the UN can consider expelling Israel. We were suspended. South Africa was suspended twice from the United Nations for apartheid. It can be done. There are things that can be done. My final word is we need states to have the political will to do it. Um, and 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 that's what can end all of this. Thank you very much, Dr. Sony. I think that's a excellent answer, um, very holistic as well. Um, and as I often like to comment, if the governments do not hold one another accountable, then the people will. Um, I just want to let everyone attending in person know that we do have uh, food available for breaking fast at quarter past six. Um, you are all very much welcome to please help yourselves to the savouries and uh, everything that's available on the tables um, on that side of the room when the time comes. Um, we're going to move on to our last speaker now, Dr. Sandra Fernandez, on the impact uh, this this um, humanitarian disaster and these atrocities have had um, on everyone's mental health. Um, so I welcome Dr. Sandra Fernandez. We will have more Q&A at the end. Um, so we're just quickly going to change setup, uh, but everyone is free to think on more questions to add to the end. So Dr. Sandra Fernandez is the Divisional Head of Neuropsychiatry um, at the University of Advertisrant. Over to you. Can I take this down? Um, so okay. this is for the teams. So oh, this is going to have okay. to continue running. Okay. Okay. So one, two. If this is for the room. Yes. This is for the space. <laughs> Sorry. Let's move this. It's out there. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, can I ask you, do I have to share what happens? 
the share the screen or not. Oh. I don't have to. Are you on the Teams meeting? No. Not. Did you send me your slides? No. Not. OK. All right. So in that case, can you join um, the Teams meeting quickly? Sorry, everyone. Technical sorry. issues, but we are getting back to it in a second. OK, I'm going to have to. I don't have the link on here on Teams on my eyes. Let me send it to you quickly. I've got it on my WhatsApp, but not. Really Dr. Sony, oh. while we are busy with setup, would you mind taking another question for us? Certainly, I'm here. Oof. I do apologize. Um, would you mind just um, answering in the affirmative in the chat? Sure. Masira, what are you asking? Um, Dr. Sony has agreed to answer the question, am I right? Sorry, our sound did cut out for a short moment there. Can I answer directly in the chat, Dr. Theron? Um, I just wanted to, I, I think it would be better if you could answer live. I just wanted to know whether you would be willing and available. Um, sure. Let's move to the question of what is your opinion about Nicaragua's case against Germany with respect to their complicity in the genocide in Gaza? Thank you. So um, thank you, Hassan Mohammed. So that's a great question. Um, you know, when the proceedings okay. were lodged at the International Court of Justice and a lot of us looked at the paper, um, the application paper, so to speak, um, we were sort of, you know, Nicaragua seems to be quite active in the International Court of Justice, and we were sort of interested to see how um, Nicaragua would frame its argument. But again, um, going back to what the Genocide Convention says about complicity, the fact that a state can be committing an offense if it actively supports a state that is committing a genocide. And as soon as that ICJ in January said that it's plausible that this is a genocide, that was a warning signal for all states that were supporting Israel that they are complicit in a plausible genocide. Um, so my opinion, um, when I read the papers, I think a lot of scholars, you know, we were a bit concerned about the strength of the argument, but in incredibly, incredibly, we have seen practical consequences because um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a German delegation that has gone to Israel to discuss international humanitarian law with the Israeli government, their obligations, what is happening in Gaza, um, and, and to sort of issue this very strong reminder. So again, it's that shift and see it happening. We see it in the language that states are starting to use, and we see it in the way states are starting to behave. Um, so the fact that Germany, that was very, you know, was one of the first states to say that they're that this is not genocide. They're convinced it's not genocide, uh, and they were very strongly supporting Israel. For them to now say and make these statements against Israel, it's very strong condemnation, and I think it's come directly from the fact that. Nicaragua has lodged proceedings against Germany. So you'll see this happen, um, Mr. Mohammed, going, going forward, that we'll see states trying to backtrack in the way they speak and trying to wash their hands of liability. And it, I, I just wonder how states like the US and the UK are going to be able to do that because their hands, they are stained very strongly. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Sony. I think um, that's going to be a difficult thing moving forward, um, holding uh, nations accountable after the fact, um, especially given that the time is passing. Um, we have now connected Dr. Sandra Fernandez to our teams, and she will take it from here. It's not showing the PowerPoint. And I need to have. All right, we're going to throw in another question. <laughs> I need someone to help because otherwise we're not going to. I'm going to start with Dr. Okay. Okay. So. There was another question above here on whether universities may be held accountable legally to uphold ethics um, and whether there are any legal ramifications for them not um, acting appropriately and, and uh, perhaps being somewhat complicit in the continuation of this genocide. Yes, I'm just trying to find the question. I'm not. I'm not sure I see that question. I believe it was asked by Summer El Barei at seven past five. Are universities accountable law-wise to uphold ethics? So, if you support an apartheid government or one that gets charged with genocide, mm -hmm. are there legal ramifications? All right, so um, no, there wouldn't be legal ramifications for the universities, but what we do see, so that first part of the question asks, are universities expected to uphold ethics? I think, you know, the answer is yes, um, and absolute yes, because if we think about it in this context, that the, that the fact that, um, you know, what we see, you know, tells us in our soul and in our mind and what the International Court of Justice has said is that we may be looking at a genocide in real time. I think it is unethical for institutions to maintain ties with institutions um, that are supporting and complicit in that genocide. And it's not to say that all of them would be. We know that, um, you know, I was told you know, in no uncertain terms that the government of Israel doesn't speak for all Israelis and it's really right-wing Israelis that support Netanyahu's um, activities. But there are people, in there are Israelis that are trying to um, get Netanyahu to end the war, that are trying to, 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 to advocate for Palestinian rights, et cetera. But we also know in universities, there are academics that are being silenced for speaking out against the genocide, Israeli academics. And we also know that there are academics that are trying to, um, trying to what, what shall I say? They are trying to um, justify and legitimize the killing of the population. So a lot of institutions have already done this. They have uh, the, and it started, you know, it, it always starts with the individual. We talk about states and organizations, but at the end of the day, we are people and we are people in these structures. We are people who can tell our government and make our government and push our government. Um, and that's what we're seeing with all those protests, all those people out there advocating for Palestine. They're making a difference. They are making a difference. And we see in academia, academics urging their institutions to cut ties with Israeli institutions. Um, you know, especially when we, we think about, for instance, the assault on academia, the fact that the universities in Palestine are destroyed, the fact that professors, um, the deans of health sciences, the deans of law, they've all been, they've all been killed. They've, they've, they've all gone, you know, so um, it's the assault on academia and um, the fact that we should rethink our ties with the state as a whole. And that's why even South Africa itself has been calling for state to sever their ties with Israel because we need to actually steer Israel 
um, to, to, to that conclusion that it has to end what it's doing? Um, I hope I answered that question adequately. Yes, very eloquently as always, uh, Dr. Sony. We really appreciate your insight. Um, by the sounds of it, it comes down to a matter of BDA. There's an echo. Hang on a second. So essentially, so boycott, boycott divestment, and sanctions of um, institutions. institutions. That is your that team. Is your team. All right, we're going to move on to Dr. Sandra Fernandez's presentation now. Thank you very much, everyone. Dr. Theron, you need to unmute for us to hear. Oh. Can everybody hear me and okay. um, online? Okay. Yes, I think I think I said yes. Okay, great. Let's hope that this works out. Okay, so um, I'm here to just give a little bit of uh, sort of insight in regards to. And I'm a bit short, so I feel like I can't see you all. But anyway. Um, to really sort of talk about a little bit around mental health in the face of a genocide. And perhaps what we should first um, start with is just look at a brief definition of mental health according to the WHO. So mental health is in an all encompassing kind of a holistic way of approaching an individual in a sense on how that person is able to interact, not just themselves and others around them, but also with the environment. And it's really about taking into consideration how that particular individual is able to handle their own stresses, how they're able to communicate with people around them and how they're able to use their coping mechanisms in order to be able to live on a day to day basis. And so the mental health of a person is really a basic human right. And it is a right that we all should have. You have already heard from the speakers before me sort of commenting around mental health. And it's crucial to the personal individual, but also as a result of their interaction with the community around them and also with their socioeconomic development.
they say they can't hear your video of this on the teams. Okay, but it's okay. It's pretty mm -hmm. long. So um, this documentary was actually done in 2019 by um, somebody called Harry Fear that I actually had the privilege of uh, about a month, two months ago, doing a, a online um, sort of meeting that we had with a, kind of a podcast and we had a whole discussion around mental health. And I really highly recommend that you go onto YouTube and you watch this particular documentary because it really only pertains to the mental health of people in Gaza. So in regards to... Um, what we have seen, let me just move forward to the next one, what we have seen in regards to what's happening around conflicts and wars around the world, if we think right back to World War I, there were really no meaningful sort of data on, on civilian casualties back then, and very little was actually known around the casualties of involvement of children. But it was really thought that about 10 million people, uh, non-combatants, that had actually died. If we fast forward to World War II, we had about 33 million people that actually um, were killed and an unspecified number of children. So obviously war is not good for children at all. And there are many direct effects of wars, obviously deaths and injuries as a result of that, but there are many indirect effects of wars, such as uh, malnutrition, which we've already heard a little bit about from some people, and that's because of the lack of resources that often encompasses what happens during times of wars and conflict. And if we even look back to the time of Second World War countries that were not invaded in any particular way, such as Malta Islands, um, but who sustained heavy bombardment from those that were involved in the war, they in fact, the impact of this is that they had birth rates that were impacted and severe malnutrition that was actually widespread. If we also even fast forward to the Vietnam War, about 10% of the casualties then were children of which really there was one million civilians that were actually killed in the 60s in the, in the Vietnam War. And half of the children from that particular war actually didn't even see their fifth birthday. Um, a lot of them died from indirect effects of war, such as um, various infectious diseases, uh, malaria, pneumonias, etc. And in the Cambodia war, which was soon after the Vietnam War, 15% of children were also malnourished as a result of that. So food has increasingly been seen and been used as a weapon of war. And in past wars, you know, mostly it was combatants that were involved in wars, but this has now subsequently been moved into the arena, into the civilian arena. And unfortunately, children are often caught at the crossfire. So adversaries in wars have always used food restrictions and terrorization of the population, um, destruction of medical facilities and social and cultural um, sites. And children, as I've said, unfortunately become casualties of war. So as I've said, war is not good for children. Um, it has, in fact, impacted them significant, and as we all know, in the current war. I'm sure some of you remember seeing this video, which was one of the earliest videos that were actually that actually came out. Um, So if you can imagine a small child who has a completely 
bewildered expression on his face, complete shell shock from most likely being pulled from under the rubble because you can see that he's got the dust on his face and all over the body. And really at that age, not really having the capacity and the language to be able to understand the trauma that he's undergoing. And that language is not available. And so that trauma is not able in any way to be expressed outwards. So it's really unfortunately during times of wars and, and, and even going back to previous wars, that's why I mentioned some of them before, that we actually gained insight into um, conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I'm not going to go through any of this because you all know what post-traumatic stress disorder is and what major depression is and what anxiety is. And these are some of the conditions that impact significantly on people that have been exposed to severe trauma. And it is also by what we have learned from past wars, it has allowed us to have a greater understanding on the risks that certain groups and certain people um, are at risk and are vulnerable in developing these kinds of conditions. So there are some risks take into consideration when we look at vulnerable individuals that in particular have been subjected to mass trauma, various things such dose dependent exposures and trauma within a particular conflict. Also, the number of war um, or traumatic events during that particular time that they've been exposed to and things like mass displacement and migration, which we are all too familiar that we have seen in this particular context that we're currently talking about. And then there are other risk factors for people that are even more vulnerable that perhaps might have a pre-existing um, neuropsychiatric condition or some kind of a psychiatric condition with a significant past medical history that there would be huge risk of developing severe trauma and further consequences, those indirect effects that I have alluded to. Now, there's been a lot of research that has been done as far back as 2005 in Palestine, looking at trauma within the region. A um, number of studies have been done looking at psychosocial problems. Um, there's a study that uh, a review that was done from the Gaza Community Mental Health um, uh, Program, where they looked at children between the ages of 10 to 19 years of age, and they found high rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, 32% requiring urgent intervention, and then others um, having relatively high rates from both moderate to much milder rates. Boys displaying much higher rates because they tend to be exposed to much higher rates of violence. And children that actually live in camps and refugee camps being much more at risk in developing some form of trauma, anxiety and depression. There's also a, quite a significant, um, what parents term, reported aggressive behaviours that has been associated in children that are involved in these wars. A lot of impact on their schooling, because of course schooling is often interrupted. Uh, and if schooling does continue, it impacts them emotionally and on their school marks. And then lots of other behavioural consequences as a result of wars. Lots of types of trauma that children that I'm concentrating particularly on children have been subjected to, such as witnessing funerals, um, witnessing shootings, um, seeing injured dead and strangers uh, of strangers or families, and children in particular that happen to live in areas of bombardment are, have shown to have very high rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. I wanted to also just highlight some studies that have previously been done, because I think what is of value in these studies is that it actually shows evidence-based um, studies that have highlighted uh, the, the impact of war on children in this particular region. So it's not something that is happening in isolation, it's something that we have 
information from before. So if we look at some of these studies, there's one particular one on the relationship be between war, trauma, PTSD, anxiety and depression, where they actually looked at northern Gaza. And this is going way back to 2019. And they looked at 200 families and what they found is that 70% of the children actually had symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. 33% had heightened levels of anxiety. And the study actually looked at about 250 children in all various ranges of ages from around 6 to 16 years of age. And all of them had a variety of traumatic experiences that had been subjected to. Another study looking at the chronic war exposure on post-traumatic stress disorder also looked at a group of about 607 participants, children, and 97.2% had actually experienced at least six traumatic experiences, with a high percentage of them, 61.2%, actually having evidence of post-traumatic stress disorder. Another study looking at depression in particular in the West Bank, and that was during 2007. This particular study was trying to highlight and think about a hypothesis that people living in the West Bank, if they are subjected to continuous trauma throughout their lifetime, that the hypothesis was that they in all likelihood would have higher rates of depression which is precisely what they have found. So what they found that the prevalence rates were 25.7% in males and about 22.9% in females. And then there's been lots of other um, interesting studies looking at personality structures well and the difficulties that people undergo um, and the poor coping skills that they develop, resulting in lots of behavioural um, difficulties in how they manage themselves and how they interact with others around them. So they also looked at a particular village, which I'm sure you've heard of, Sidrot, which is quite close to the Gaza Strip and uh, it, where Israeli, Israelis live. And they looked at some eighth and ninth graders at school. And they also found relatively high rates, 43.5% of children had actually clinical symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So all of these um, highlighting the significant impact that war has, and in particular on children, of course it has on adults too. Not to forget much more current studies. So there's a very interesting recent study that came out in The Lancet um, looking at post-traumatic stress disorder after the October 7th attack. Um, it's a little bit of a flawed study in the sense how it was structured. So it's a little bit problematic, but nevertheless, it, the premise, the underlying premise showing that it has had significant impact in terms of anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it, there was just some difficulties around the bias that was used in how they went about and captured this information. But it is important to note that it has significantly impacted Israeli society too. So we mustn't forget that as well. They found uh, rates around prevalence rates, probable prevalence rates around 29.8% for post-traumatic stress disorder in the Israeli population, 44.8% for depression and 42.7% for anxiety. So children in war zones seem to have and those in Gaza and those in the occupied territories have very high rates of significant impact on their mental health. And what's come of this is that, unfortunately, from this tremendous trauma, and I think even beyond, because I've been talking to you about post-traumatic stress disorder, but the actual word implies it's post the trauma. That's what it actually means. And then you experience various symptoms as a result of that ongoing. But here we're not talking about a post-trauma. We're actually talking about an ongoing, constant, unrelentless trauma. So I'm not sure what the word or the what we would use to now describe this particular um, 
syndrome that we're kind of seeing because it's slightly different to what we are actually used to and what we use in, in trying to evaluate these kind of symptoms that people display. So the extent of all this is that, unfortunately, even more recently, a new term has, has been seen and, and we've seen it in, the, in social media, wounded child with no surviving family. And that's because how this war has impacted children. We are looking at about currently, if the estimates are correct, it's noted that about 17 to 19,000 children have become orphaned. And there's probably around, they say around maybe a thousand children that have multiple amputations uh, as a result of the conflict. So you can imagine the trauma that's associated with all of this and the impact that it has. So where to from now? Because how do we build resilience? How do we help people to move forward? And there is a multi-dimensional model of resilience that um, is thought of, that one can think of in moving forward. Um, this resilience type of model has actually been structured on children born of genocide or rape in Rwanda, which looks at a very inclusive and intergenerational approach in order to support strengths in order to build resilience and resources and in order to capacitate an entire system. And this multidimensional resilience model works from bottom up and top down approach. And the bottom up approach is looking at the individual first and how that individual functions within the immediate community, etc. And then a top down approach from both a global perspective and a national perspective. So from bottom up in terms of, of for example, the individual in the family, it's about thinking that families need to be fluid, especially in times of conflict, because they often are displaced or they separated, or as we currently see now, many become orphaned. So there has to be a development and a new structure in thinking around how that new family is going to exist for the particular individual children or adults. And in the community setting, that both social and cultural factors need, networks need to be rebuilt and also Public hearings perhaps need to be considered. So what Rwanda did during the time of the genocide is that they actually set up um, sort of lay judges who adjudicated and heard evidence on many perpetrators. Kind of sounds a lot like what we might, we, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And they did a lot of that. We had huge investment for Rwanda in order to try and move forward from the genocide that they experienced. And in fact, Rwanda has become almost a postmark uh, case for success following a genocide in that the, the economy is one of the top economies in Africa now. And they've really, they invested a huge amount in, in terms of not just money, but in terms of individuals and support in order to build the population going forwards because of um, you know, the, the millions of people that lost their lives. So nationally, for example, it's about sharing. So from the top down national aspect, it's about sharing solidarity and restoring some kind of basic national um, functioning and rebuilding once again a society. Now, for example, in the case of Rwanda, what they did is that they removed the whole identification around ethnicity. And they actually removed your ethnic status in your ID cards. And all that they had was one sort of national identification of everybody. You were not a Houthi or you were not a, you know, you were, you were just a Rwandan and that's it. So those were some of the things that nationally Rwanda employed in order to try to build uh, solidarity. 
globally, so the involvement in terms of global input. Now, we've seen global input on various things, for example, like in the climate crisis, where there's a lot of global movements and, and involvement. And what this has shown is that there is a recognition now that nations are very much interconnected, that we are not, we don't live in isolation. And there is a sort of shared global responsibility. So if we think back to following the Holocaust, uh, following the Holocaust, there was kind of the rhetoric that was quite prominent, never again. Okay, And that was something that actually was highlighting in order to say that this is not something that we are going to allow to happen to anyone else. There has to be a recognition that there is a collective responsibility in terms of moving forwards. So what about healthcare workers? So healthcare workers, as you know, are in a unique, have unique challenges, especially in our current um, war on Gaza. And that's because of the intensity and the impact that this war has had on the emotional toll of the healthcare worker. Um, both from the immediate violence that they potentially subjected to, but also the kind of the instability within the system that just crumbles and has crumbled. Um, the targeting of hospitals, uh, and not just the targeting of hospitals, but just not having the basic things that you need to be able to function as a healthcare worker in order to provide that that need and that treatment that, that you have to for your patient. So there's disruption of services. Um, they themselves that have been in a, an environment that is safe, being a hospital, now are actually in unsafe places. Um, healthcare workers completely overburdened and the capacity just being overflowed. Uh, if you think about you know, in the hospitals. In the hospitals, you're there and you treat your patient. But in this particular case that we're looking at, it's the hospital is not just a shelter for those that are sick and injured, but it's become a shelter just for people to have refuge. And so now you have this, these hospitals where you you as a healthcare worker, not only have you have to, to sort of deal with your own emotions and, and the consequences of what's happening, you know, during the war that you're experiencing, but also everyone around you, some of whom are not even patients themselves, but they just happen to be there. So there's a lot of emotional demands, emotional demands, not just from people around you, but also from families and families that you are not able to see on a regular basis. So there's lots of struggles that are currently taking place. And of course, the trauma of just being in the position where you have to undertake certain procedures without having things like anesthetics or certain drugs in order to really undertake um, quite traumatic procedures like amputations, for example, that that in itself becomes traumatic for the healthcare worker because you are having to now live through this process where your pers the person that you are working on is under no anesthesia. So quickly moving on to medical ethics and where do you stand? So the core curriculum of human on human rights, ethics and medical law for healthcare professionals of South Africa actually has been set up on the premise of the things that happened in the past as a result of apartheid. And this core curriculum has been set up in order to prevent once again those injustices that did happen in the past of which many medical doctors were actually complicit in um, taking part in, in many injustices in our country. So medical ethics is also, and a part of this curriculum is also an understanding that there has to be a role of moral virtues in medical doctors. And that's about, there's an expectation that medical doctors 
medical professionals need to have virtuous character, things like, such as compassion, understanding and kindness, empathy, and being able to really see things much more holistically. So this underlying premise in terms of medical professions having a virtuous character, it all is underlying the premise of the social contract that we have in society as medical practitioners. And that is that society expects us to advocate for those that are vulnerable, for those that are not do not have a voice, for those that cannot fend for themselves. And that's the social contract that we have with society. So the Health Professionals Council has guidelines which seeks to promote human rights and to ensure, as I mentioned earlier, that the past failures do not repeat themselves. And also this premise in terms of this medical ethics is that there should be a commitment to far reaching social responsibility that we have beyond our little bubble of just us and maybe the patients that we see and the relationship that we see, but to actually have an understanding that something that is far more reaching than that that we need to think beyond our immediate surroundings so that there is no complicity in human rights and abuses going forwards. When silence kills, and, and that's just something that I've recently written, which if you follow South African Journal of Bioethics at some point, it will, it will come out as an opinion piece that I've written. But our responsibility as clinicians is to advocate for those that do not have a voice. The children, the sick, the infirm, those with disabilities, the environment, the animals, irrespective of our religious affiliations, our political views and our philosophical views too. That we have to learn how to bring ourselves outside of what our own individual views might be, especially around religion and politics and all these complex issues, and, and have a greater understanding on how we should be thinking with those virtuous traits on and have compassion and understanding for the injustices around us. So being neutral in the face of a genocide actually means that one is siding on the side of the oppressor. And our role is really to expose human rights abuses and to use our position and our voice in order to raise these issues at multiple levels so that we are not complicit in crimes against humanity. So mental health is often a, a, a neglected aspect of medicine but it has far reaching repercussions, as you can see in what I've tried alluded to and shown on the different wars and what's currently happening in the war in Gaza, because it has far reaching intergenerational trauma and this trauma that continues with further generations. And this war in Gaza has become the tipping point globally as an exposure as well to the injustices, the injustice against humanity. That still exists and we need to acknowledge that. And it has exposed that global trauma that has happened. So I hope that going forwards, you will advocate for everyone around you, irrespective of where that person comes from and whatever their background is, whatever their religious affiliation is, their political view is, or their philosophical views. So going back to where I started off, you saw that little child initially that had been subjected to severe trauma and you saw that, that horror in his face and his inability to really comprehend what was happening to him. And this is the same child.
So going forward, you can imagine, so we don't know if this child is still alive, actually. And that area where you saw has actually, it's one of the many United Nations shelters that have been bombed. So going forward, you can see the tremendous amount of work that is necessary to rebuild. You know, it's easy to think about and much easier to think about the rebuilding of the structures and the, the infrastructure in Gaza. But the core of the individual is what is going to require the most work and to prevent the trauma to continue going forwards, not just in Palestinians, but in Israelis too. And it is this trauma that needs to be dealt with that really has, it's these indirect effects of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, that, that really has a huge impact on the individual, on the greater community. And it is this mental health that needs to be urgently addressed. I thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Sandra Fernandez. I think that was an excellent talk. And I don't think we pay enough attention to the mental health. Okay. I think um, mental health is a often neglected component of um, conflicts and genocides. Um, this one in particular, as you say, will have very far reaching effects. And we really thank you for um, elaborating on exactly the scope of that impact and the fact that it's intergenerational as well. It's not just restricted to the generation living through it right now. Um, so now uh, I hope that everyone has been able to break fast. Um, we will be moving on to some Q&As.